In the excitement of the upcoming Avatar content from the newly established Avatar Studios, as well as the live-action version coming from Netflix, I once again got the urge to talk about this wonderful universe. And thus, we will be reviving the series which started with my very first upload on this channel. And in the spirit of change, I believe we can improve the initial format to make this whole thing much, much more exciting. I plan on leaving the first video there as a piece of history, Though, if there is enough demand, I guess I can remake the video in this new format as well. So, what changes exactly will there be? Well, I think a more interesting way of handling these rankings is, of course, with a good old tier list, which we'll be bringing into this series. But, since we're talking about Avatar here, I can't with a clear conscience rate any episode as F tier. So, um, just a few little tweaks and, um, yeah. Yeah, that looks about right. We'll be ranking each episode of each season against each other to determine which ones are the best. So, as much as I'd like to rank everything in the highest tier, that will not happen. And to set the standards even more intense, we'll set limitations for each tier. Meaning that there will always be at least one D tier episode, which already made me feel a little conflicted if I'm being honest. And if I can break the fourth wall real quick, this was genuinely one of the hardest videos to write, as I really had a very hard time trying to rank these episodes without feeling that I'm selling many of them shorts. But other than that, I'll talk about what I think are the best and most important moments of each episode, which should back up my rating. But let's not waste any more time and jump straight into episode 201, The Avatar State. As the name suggests, this episode is primarily concerned with Aang understanding the Avatar state. We open the episode with a series of flashbacks, where Aang experiences the devastation he himself caused while he was in the state, making him question whether he should even wield such power. On the Fire Nation side, we see Zuko and Iroh recovering after the events of Book 1. Though, more importantly, we see the proper introduction of Azula. Just like we saw at the very end of Book 1, she's going after her brother and uncle straight away. We'll spend a little more time on this here and not focus on it too much later, but I think two very important details are also established here. Firstly, we see that Azula's bending far outclasses Zuko. We see her easily generate lightning, essentially now being just concerned with perfecting the arts. Thus, we know that straight away, pure power-wise, she is already a much larger threat. But we also learn that her approach is a lot more calculated and cunning than Zuko's, thereby making her immensely more dangerous than the more hot-headed Zuko, whose only concern was chasing down the Avatar and fighting him head-on. This culminates in the fight between Azula and Zuko, where she easily outclasses him, all the while playing on his emotions by throwing insults. And lastly, we see that she has absolutely no problem shooting lightning even at her own family, cementing the idea that she is more dangerous than the threats we've seen so far in almost every single way. All of this establishes Azula as the largest threat to all parties throughout Book 2. While we saw some of that with Zhao in Book 1, Azula turns that up to 11, with both Zuko and Aang having to deal with this new threat, which I think is one of the biggest strong points of Book 2. And the final super important scene from this side of the conflict is of course Zuko and Iroh cutting their hair to symbolize their turn against the Fire Nation, which would obviously be a hugely important plot for the latter half of this season and most of Book 3. On the side of Team Avatar, there are a few noteworthy things. Firstly, and this is something that I feel many people overlook, we are shown that the world of Avatar is not just black and white, as we see an Earthbender openly trying to exploit Aang's abilities. For the most part, all the quote-unquote evil actions we've seen in the show have been committed by the all-bad Firebenders, but here we are reminded that overgeneralization is indeed a fallacy. This will of course become a bigger plot with the Dai Li, but more on that later. Lastly, we get some pretty major lore surrounding the Avatar state from Roku. We learn that if Aang dies while in the Avatar state, the cycle of Avatars would be broken. This establishes a very crucial downside to the power. While it massively empowers Aang, there is a chance that the entire world could be thrown out of balance if Aang is defeated while in the state. 
it essentially turns Aang into a glass cannon, in turn answering the important question of why don't avatars use it every single time they fight. As you'd expect from a premiere, there are quite a bit of important plot lines that are being established here. Hence, I think it deserves a high rank. But the reason why it is comparatively low will become clear as we get through the season. So, with that being said, I think this is a C tier episode. Episode 202 The Cave of Two Lovers. This is a much lighter episode than the season premiere, with many parts of it being quite comedy heavy. On the side of Team Avatar, we see the gang meet up with this group of nomads who figure out that they need to get through the ancient cave of two lovers. There are plenty of great comedic moments from Sokka as well as many of the other characters when they interact with the nomads, but I think the best one absolutely has to be the Secret Tunnel song. Till this very day, me and my friends still often shout out the iconic Secret Tunnel song. And finally, we see Aang's and Katara's relationship develop further, as they try to talk around having to kiss to get through the cave. In part, adding to the comedic nature of the episode, as it was very awkward, but also developing them as characters. On Zuko and Iroh's side, we do get some more stories of the Fire Nation's unspeakable actions when Zuko and Iroh are welcomed to dinner by a local family. This in turn just plants those seeds of doubt about the Fire Nation in Zuko, which would become much more important later. However, as I mentioned, there is still plenty of comedy on their side as well, as this is where the famous delectable tea or deadly poison meme comes from. With all of that being said, I think this deserves a solid C largely simply due to the comedy here being extremely solid, with both the secret tunnel song as well as the Iroh T quandary being relevant to this day. Episode 203, Return to Omashu. As the name suggests, this episode deals with the gang returning to Omashu with the hopes of Bumi teaching Ankh earthbending. As they arrive, however, they see that the city has been completely overtaken by the Fire Nation, which is where the episode essentially begins. This is also the first proper introduction of Mei and Tai Li, as Azula goes around assembling her squad to go after the Avatar and Zuko. Speaking of which, this is another instance of us being shown how Azula has no problem exploiting the ones closest to her to get something out of them, as she essentially pushes Tai Li to join her. What I think is an interesting aspect of this episode is the plot surrounding Mei's baby brother. We see that Azula refuses to trade King Bumi for Mei's brother, which Mei goes along with almost straight away. In hindsight, I think this is just an aspect of just how much sway Azula had over Mei, as personally, I don't think Mei was okay with this. But looking past that, I think Aang later returning the baby home safe just speaks to how different their worldviews are. Aang is essentially the only one with a truly neutral perspective, which, as the Avatar, is of course his biggest strength. He understands that this kid has done absolutely nothing wrong, and that they don't deserve any of this, which is why he risks going back into Omashu to return him safely. Which goes against a lot of what we've seen in the series so far, with even the mention of the Fire Nation being almost taboo. If you've watched my power creep video on this, you already know, but perhaps even more importantly, this is where Aang learns of Neutral Jing, which he would later leverage against the Sparky Sparky Boom Man. All in all, this episode is a lot more action-y, but is still mainly set up for the rest of Azula's arc. Hence, I think this is the slowest episode of the season, and will sadly be taking the lowest tier. Again, it is by no means a bad episode, but that's simply how it works out in this format. Episode 204, The Swamp. This one's quite a bit slower than the first couple of episodes on both sides of the story. Zuko and Iroh appear very, very briefly at the beginning and the end of the episode, with the most important part being the reintroduction of the Blue Spirits. Other than that, their story does take a little bit of a backseat for now. As for Aang and the rest of the team, as the name suggests, they explore a swamp after Aang feels like something is calling to him. We then see each of them deal with their own personal stories. Sokka sees Yue, Katara sees her mother, but Aang of course sees Toph, a person who he hasn't even met before. 
which prompts them to reevaluate their criteria of finding him an earthbending teacher. This is also the first time we see the swamp benders, in other words, water benders who specialize in using water in foliage and other plant matter. Even though nothing super crucial happens, I do think this is a very good example of world building. So far, the only real waterbenders we had seen were at the southern and northern poles, but now we are seeing that there are more of them out there, who are using it in almost completely different ways when compared to their more wintry cousins. With all that being said, I think this is a C tier episode. Although it's a fun one, not much crucial plot happens and since we do have limits in the tiers, I just have to push this one down. Episode 205, Avatar Day. This too is a bit of a lighter episode in terms of plot importance. On the side of Zuko and Iroh, we see them grow further apart, as Zuko cannot come to terms with having to live a bit of a simpler life, turning to theft as the Blue Spirit. Primarily, it's just Iroh trying to teach Zuko that he can find a new purpose and that he should not feel bad about no longer being associated with the Fire Nation. And finally, we see them part ways completely. On Aang's side, we get to see another very interesting example of world building. So far, we've always assumed that mostly everyone respects the Avatar. Some might blame him for not being there when the war began, but in most cases, it's just the Fire Nation that straight up wants to get rid of him. In this case, however, we see that things are a little more complicated than that, as people of the Earth Nation absolutely despise him here. And so, we get some lore about Avatar Kyoshi and what caused this conflict in the first place. I think there's an interesting conversation to be had here around the interpretation of history. As from our point of view, Kiyoshi just wanted to protect her own people. On the flip side, she did also take out their leader, which just leads to both sides blaming each other. Another conversation point to be brought up is just how long to retain those historical grudges. While Aang is the Avatar, he is obviously his own person. So, should he really be held accountable for the actions of his ancestors? And if so, why? Also, side note, this is one of very few times in the original series we actually see lava bending, with Kyoshi using what appears to be lava bending in the flashback. So, with all that being said, I think this is another C tier episode. We do, of course, see Zuko and Iroh part ways for now, which is pretty major but the story on Aang's side isn't super high stakes. Episode 206, The Blind Bandit. And now we enter the long gauntlet of back-to-back -back major episodes, with this one arguably being among the most important, as we get the introduction of Toph. Also, we get some very solid memes out of this one. Firstly, it's the Water Tribe instance, and then of course the absolute meme that is the Boulder himself. And a bit of a meta fact, Toph was originally supposed to be a tough looking brash teenage boy, obviously a far cry from how Toph turned out. Just like Brian mentions in the Art of the Animated series, at this point I cannot imagine Toph any other way, so I think it definitely worked out for the best. And if we're speaking more broadly, I think it's also a great inclusivity aspect of the show. Brian also points this out in the book, they always thought that the show would resonate with the female audience as well, so I think having this absolutely awesome earthbender be a woman was just a win all around. Returning to the plot, as Toph is of course a very major character, we see her arc set up straight away, as she comes to terms with having to leave her family and join up with a gang. I would really recommend checking out the fantastic video done by Hello Future Me, which delves deeper into Toph's character arc and the motifs it explores. I'll drop a link in the description as I think it does a great job of explaining several aspects of Toph's character, which would just take up a little too much time in this video. So with this in mind, I think it's no surprise that this should be a very high ranking episode, and is thus a double S episode. Episode 207 Zuko Alone Alright, this one is absolutely fantastic in more ways than one. Firstly, and this is something that I feel like I bring up quite often when talking about the series, you have to remember the target audience and the network of Avatar, that being Nickelodeon. So seeing this focus episode for what is, for all intents and purposes, a villain for now, is very very big. 
And I think even the biggest Zuko hater would have to agree that this episode does a brilliant job of humanizing Zuko and making you relate to his struggle a lot. Especially once we get the flashbacks to his and Azula's childhood, which begin to finally make the puzzle pieces fit as to why Zuko is the way he is. We see just how much he was pushed aside by his father and how much he was overshadowed by his sister, which combined with what we found about the Agni Kai Zuko had against his father really makes you begin to question whether he really is as bad as we've been led to believe. Not only that, but we also get a look at how twisted the royal family really is, with both Ozai's treatment of both Zuko as well as his wife and the very convenient passing of the previous Fire Lord. All in all, this is an absolutely amazing character focus episode, which sets a lot of later plot lines surrounding Zuko into motion. Hence, I think this is a very, very high double S tier episode for sure. And if I can break the fourth wall for a moment, if I could ignore the imposed limits on each tier, this would absolutely be a triple S episode. There are just two more that I enjoyed very slightly more than this one. But let's move on to episode 208, The Chase. As the name suggests, this episode is all about the gang trying to outrun Azula and her newly established squad of Ty Lee and Mei. But if I'm being honest, I feel like the real premise of this episode is actually more so about the integration of Toph into the group, with the chase by Azula being their very first trial as this newly established team avatar. For example, we see that Toph is still thinking as if she was on her own. When building the tent, she tells the group that they shouldn't worry about her, and that she already has her set up. All of these little conflicts that occur in the episode are largely to do with Toph not realizing that she is now part of a team, as it clashes with her wanting to be independent, the very reason why she left home in the first place. Though aside from that, two other pretty interesting things happen here. Firstly, we get the absolutely awesome sequence of Toph meeting Uncle Iroh. Not much else to say here, just seeing the interaction between the two opposite sides here was really cool. Though it's also worth noting that this little meetup would come up later in this episode as well as at the end of the season. But even more importantly, we are further shown Azula's power at the end of this episode. We are once again led to believe that Zuko may just be switching sides for good once they begin attacking Azula. But that hope is ripped away once Azula manages to outclass all six of them, causing Zuko to scream out at Team Avatar and sending them away. But again, Azula still coming out on top in a situation like this is very notable. Not just in sheer power, but due to her, again, having no problem hurting those close to her. In this case, purposely targeting her uncle. So, with all that being said, I think this is a very solid B-tier episode. Episode 209, Bitter Work. This one's an interesting one, as it's essentially just about both Zuko and Aang training. On Aang's side, with Toph now joining the crew, he begins to learn earthbending, which is when we get a little bit of more lore about the elements. We find out that the reason Aang might be having so much trouble with earthbending could be because it is his direct opposite. While airbending is all about agile movement and dodging, earthbending is much more stoic. In other words, simply taking the attack head on and waiting for your own opportunity. Though this little detail about opposites doesn't really hold in Legend of Korra, but that's not entirely relevant here, it's just another nice world building detail. Though I'd argue what we learn on Zuko's side is even more important, as this is yet another instance of us being teased at the true power of Iroh. We see him explain that lightning bending is, in essence, the purest form of fire bending possible. It is not reliant on any form of emotion. It is cold, precise, and deadly. Again, if you've seen my previous videos on Avatar, I've mentioned this quite a few times already, but I feel like lightning in The Last Airbender is very purposely used exclusively with the intention to kill. The only three people we ever see who are capable of generating lightning are Iroh, Azula, and Ozai. Thing is, the only times we ever see it used is from Azula and Ozai when they directly try to kill. 
I've gone a little more in depth about the subject in both my retrospective as well as the power creep video in Avatar, so I'd recommend checking out those to hear my extended thoughts on that. But returning to Iroh here, we see that almost like the Avatar, Iroh has been learning techniques from other nations, which has led him to develop an entirely new lightning redirection technique based on waterbending. This, combined with what we've seen from him so far, especially with events such as him going against Zhao at the end of Book 1, and him seeing into the spirit world on the Winter Solstice, should make you immediately question just who Iroh really is. Because this bumbling uncle persona is definitely not the whole deal. So, with all that being said, I think this is an A-tier episode, with plenty of character development for both Aang and Zuko. Episode 210, The Library. As the name suggests, the episode is all about the gang venturing into an ancient lost library with all the knowledge in the world. And personally, I feel like this is one of the most overlooked episodes in the entire series, as it is an absolutely masterful example of world building. And there are several reasons why I think that is the case. Firstly, the whole ambiance of the library fits perfectly in the wider universe, especially once we meet Wan Shi Tong himself. We already knew that there were spirits who roamed the earth freely, just like Wan Shi Tong here. But unlike many of the spirits we've seen, he is a true neutral character with absolutely no affiliation to anyone. His only rule is that you have to offer up a piece of information. And these sorts of unaffiliated characters are the ones that I absolutely love seeing in these sorts of fantasy stories. And to my fellow serious gamers out there, it should come as no surprise that my favorite character of RE8 was the ambiguous Duke, who functions fairly similarly to Wan Shi Tong. But secondly, the library is actually an explanation of where Zhao found the piece of information that led to the attack on the Northern Water Tribe. It was here where he learned of the Moon Spirit's mortal form, which now recontextualizes a lot of that information. And this is also where the Wan Shi Tong's ban on humans entering the library comes from. But lastly, and this is more of a me thing, I have always loved the idea of there being this forgotten place that holds vast amounts of ancient knowledge. It's just a story aspect that I think can be leveraged for so so many different stories. Starting from almost Lovecraftian horror of someone finding a lost Necronomicon, to a futuristic sci-fi story of people finding these libraries and trying to piece together human history. But yeah, that's just a broader storytelling thing. Returning to the episode itself, this is of course also a turning point in the series as we learn of the upcoming solar eclipse. Again, I've talked about it a lot more in my video on the Day of Black Sun, but this is an immensely important point in the story following which every single action will be motivated by that final assault. And lastly, this is of course the episode where Toph has to make the hard decision between saving Appa or the gang, which results in the Sandbenders taking Appa. And this may be another instance of everyone's favorite segment, but my headcanon says that this is what ultimately led Toph to master sandbending later in the series. In this episode, we see her barely being able to do anything in the sand, but after being powerless in this sort of situation, she trained to make sure nothing like this can happen again. And this is demonstrated much much later in the series, with Toph being able to recreate the entirety of Ba Sing Se with a single move. Whether this was intended or not, I think it is a very interesting little detail that does make the story a little more complex. So, with all that being said, it should come as no surprise that I think this is at least an S-tier episode. Episode 211, The Desert. This is a really interesting one as the group is thrown into a situation seemingly with absolutely no way out. With Appa being taken, they now have to traverse the barren desert on their own two feet with little to no supplies. And so, we get some very interesting character dynamics here. Firstly, as you'd expect, Aang is grieving over the loss of Appa, and for the first time in the show, he openly lashes out against everyone around him, even leaving them alone while he goes off to search for Appa. While of course completely understandable, 
he has lost sight of the bigger picture. They are the only ones who know of the solar eclipse. For all intents and purposes, if they don't survive, the Fire Nation will subjugate the rest of the world. Secondly, we see Katara stepping up to the plate and taking the leadership position here. Without her, it's doubtful they would have stuck to the plan and ultimately got out alive. So I think this is a fairly crucial point in her character development. These two points about Aang and Katara culminate once they meet the Sandbenders, perfectly encapsulating both of their subplots. We see that Aang actually wants to get revenge. The pure hatred and rage has even pushed him into the Avatar states, which at this point in the series, he still cannot control on his own. Katara, on the other hand, realizes that there is no point in bloodshed. Walks up to the enraged Aang, fully knowing that he might accidentally harm her, and just hugs him. And the scene of tears rolling down Aang's face while he is still in the Avatar state, just chef's keys. One final thing on the side of Team Avatar is a moment I just can't not bring up. That is of course, Sokka and the Cactus Juice. Just like the Cabbage Man which massively outgrew any expectations the writers might have had for a quick gag, the Sokka Cactus Juice ad is among the best moments in the series. And um, Nickelodeon? I wouldn't turn down some Cactus Juice merch. Just saying. On the side of Zuko and Iroh, by far the most important event here is of course the tease of the White Lotus. While it is still kept very, very ambiguous as to what the organization actually is, we do at least see that they are in all corners of the world. Again, calling back to just how much Iroh is actually in contact with people of the other nations. So, with all that being said, I think this is a great character focused episode where we got some very raw emotions from the main gang. Hence, I think this is an A tier episode. Episode 212, The Serpent's Pass. I think this is an episode whose ranking may surprise a lot of people, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The episode is all about the gang having to traverse the immensely dangerous Serpent's Pass, as they meet a family who cannot travel the safe route by ship. The first thing that I really love about this episode, and I think this will come as no surprise at this point, I think it is a wonderful example of world building again. These sorts of local legends just make the world feel that much more alive. Having these places whose names alone drive fear into people is just a very nice storytelling tool that, again, just makes the world feel more real. The second aspect of this episode that I feel is important is how well it works off of the events in the desert. Much of this episode is directly dealing with Aang's processing of losing Appa, and I think the very first sequence is a good example of that. We are shown that Aang has seemingly already gotten over the whole thing, and says that all he wants to do is deliver the message about the solar eclipse to the Earth King. Though as we see throughout the episode, Aang is very emotionally detached, responding to Katara's hug almost as if he hadn't heard a thing, and simply bows. All of that of course changes at the end of the episode. Seeing the baby being born, Aang finally opens back up and stops trying to avoid his emotions. And this time, it's Aang hugging Katara, paralleling the interaction before. We also see Suki again, which is always a plus in my book. With how important her role was in many ways, till this very day I still feel like her not appearing in The Legend of Korra was a massive drawback. But that's beside the point. Returning to the plot of this episode. For one, it was just very endearing to see her and Sokka interact, but I think it also contributed to Sokka's development quite a bit. In a similar sense to Aang, Sokka has also somewhat been pushing aside his emotions ever since losing Yue. But I think if you deconstruct it a little more, it's more so a case of Sokka trying to protect himself from loss, with him being afraid of losing Suki, just like he did with Yue. But as we see in this episode, Suki is more than capable of protecting herself, which ultimately pushes Sokka away from that overprotective attitude. On Zuko's side of the story, the main plot is essentially just the reappearance of Jets, which prompts Zuko to once again don the mask of the Blue Spirit. So with that being said, and as I kind of alluded to before, I think this is a very solid B-tier episode. Episode 213, The Drill. 
We'll start with Zuko and Iroh here, as their roles are very, very brief. Most of their story in this episode is pretty much just them trying to get into Ba Sing Se. But some trouble starts to brew once Jet picks up on the fact that they may just be firebenders. It's pretty much just the final piece of setup before we get into the Ba Sing Se arc. On the side of Team Avatar, on the other hand, we get our first major battle with Aang now using three elements. I didn't mention this in the episode before, but the reveal of the drill was a pretty big deal in the first place, and this episode picks up exactly where that left off. And one quick detail that I couldn't help but find a little amusing looking at now, was how explicitly Toph says that she won't enter the drill because she cannot bend there. Little did we know, that would change in just a few short episodes. But this is also where we can start piecing together that there's some fishy business going on. As the very walls of Ba Sing Se were about to be breached, the resistance was essentially non-existent. The entire episode is pretty action-heavy, so many of what makes this a very good episode is just the fight choreography and animation, especially the final standoff between Aang and Azula. For example, this double front flip strike from Azula is still one of my favorite shots in the entire series. And then of course Aang going up the wall and smashing back down. There's just a lot of great moments to this one. So, it should come as no surprise that I think this is an A-tier episode for sure. Episode 214, City of Walls and Secrets. Coming off of the action of the previous episode, this one's a little more low-key but the action is replaced by almost mystery on both the side of Team Avatar as well as Zuko and Iroh. I feel like this is one of those episodes that, even more so than others, will never be the same on rewatching them. I distinctly remember the first time I watched these couple of episodes and I was puzzled as to just what is happening within Ba Sing Se. This was meant to be the goal for this season. With the invasion plans in hand, this should have been a triumphant victory, but instead we begin to suspect that all is not as it seems, and that maybe the untouchable city of Ba Sing Se was not so untouchable after all. And the very final scenes of this episode? Ooh boy, they still give me goosebumps to this day. Seeing Jet legitimately being brainwashed by, again, Earthbenders, not the all bad Fire Nation, just further establishes that idea I brought up before. This world is not black and white. And like, I know I've said this numerous times before, but I'm very surprised that Nickelodeon ever agreed to air something as dark and mature as this for younger audiences. On the side of Zuko, we of course see Jet finally try to oust him as a firebender which backfires as Zuko never resorts to bending. But again, I think the best aspect here has to once again be the choreography of the sword fight, as we have never really seen such a fight in the show. And so, this is another one that will be ranking comparatively low simply due to the restrictions of this format. It will have to be a B-tier episode, but it is a really great one regardless. Episode 215 the Tales of Ba Sing Se. Yep, I know you were waiting for this one, and frankly, I think you know exactly what I'm going to say. Well, first off, I think it's worth talking about the formats of this episode, as it is a one-time thing in the series. Nothing even remotely close to this ever happens in both the original as well as The Legend of Korra. Yet again, I think it was a very bold choice to include these sorts of mini-stories that don't necessarily progress the plot and they're not high action or high stakes. For all intents and purposes, this is the dictionary definition of filler, right? Yet both I and many of you consider this episode as one of the best in the entire series. And I think it is because of how different it is. And I suppose just like the format, the stories within the episode are also vastly different. The settings they take you is all over the place. You get the somewhat introspective tale of Toph and Katara, the quite whimsical tales of Sokka and Aang, the quite emotional and touching tale of Zuko, and of course, the heavy hitters, the emotionally devastating tales of Momo and Iroh. 
The Momo one is just plain cruel. Watching him hopelessly and desperately looking for his friend did not make me exactly happy. And there will be a day when I make a standalone video on the tale of Iroh. But because I don't want to make you or me miserable for the rest of the day, we won't talk about it too much here. I will however tell you something that is quite personal. I don't get emotional over stories. I mean yeah, I'll feel sad, but it's never really emotion. I don't know why, but something in my brain just always tells me this is not real, therefore you shouldn't take it seriously. The Tale of Iroh is the exception. I mean, of course, this is one of the triple S episodes. Episode 216, Appa's Lost Days. Oh, Mike and Brian, you have no idea how much damage you've done with these two episodes. If you are watching the show back to back, watching Appa's Lost Days is almost like a, oh, you weren't crying yet? We'll see about that. Yeah. This episode is another roller coaster of emotions. We first see Appa being taken to a circus where this twisted owner pushes him to do dangerous stunts for the audience. And I guess on the note of this, how do circuses still exist IRL and how have they not been banned yet? They're finally being limited in a lot of countries, but like, how is there not just a blanket ban on them? And I think this is very much the idea that this episode echoes. Sure, the whole antagonistic nature is exaggerated for the sake of the story, but the reality of these circus animals being held in cages for days at a time is very much reality. After he finally runs away from the circus, we see Appa being hurt many times over in his desperate search for Aang, finally ending up in a small structure in the forest. Suki and the Kyoshi warriors come across him and clean him up making you hopeful that things might finally be looking up for everyone's favorite flying bison. But of course, then Azula and her gang shows up and poor Appa is once again on his own. He meets the guru who guides him to Ba Sing Se, which is where the tale of Momo comes full circle, as we see how Appa's paw print got there. This is a very strong episode emotionally and goes to show how well the series has managed to get you attached to Appa. While many series can tell a tragic animal story and make you feel sad, I think this one is much more than that, as we follow him through his journey not just as Aang's animal companion, but as a proper part of Team Avatar. And yeah, I am very biased to animal stories in general, so I think this for sure is a double S episode. Episode 217, Lake Laogai. It is at this episode where we enter the end game of book 2, with every moment following this episode largely building toward the finale. First and foremost, we see the return of Jess, who, with the help of Katara's healing, can make his memories of the Dai Li resurface. And thus, with the insight of where they conduct their corrupt operations, the gang makes their way to the infamous Lake Laogai in search of Appa. And just like I mentioned in the episode City of Walls and Secrets, having such a dark storyline here is very surprising for a Nickelodeon show. To this day, the Judees being brainwashed into reciting the script about there being no war in Ba Sing Se still gives me the creeps. Also, the sound design is absolutely on point here. We get this eerie slow piano while they explore the secret chambers that gives you that almost classic horror vibe that then fades into the triumphant theme as we see Jet open the door, obviously leading us to believe that this door leads to Appa, which is then sharply intercepted by the theme of the blue spirits as we see Zuko instead of Aang and the crew as we'd expect. And the Zuko part here is just plain awesome. In large part thanks to Iroh who finally confronts Zuko and gives his iconic speech about having to ask the big questions about what he himself wants. Culminating in Zuko throwing the Mask of the Blue Spirit away and saving Appa. This sequence here is very much deserving of the chef's keys. 
On the side of the Avatar, this dark plotline is carried on even further, as we basically see Jet killed at the hands of the Dai Li. Obviously, this would become a joke later on, with Sokka saying that it was very unclear whether Jet died, but obviously this was purely because the show had to abide by Nickelodeon's standards, so showing deaths on screen was a big no-no. Thus, with all that being said, this is another S-tier episode, but the lowest S-tier due to me enjoying the library and a yet undisclosed episode just a teeny bit more. Episode 218, The Earth King. After their reunion with Appa, the crew decides to head straight for the palace and to talk to the Earth King themselves, which is where we get this absolutely awesome sequence as they near the palace. You can tell me the shot of Aang not even flinching and smashing the rock to pieces is not just on point. And the whole assault sequence is just super exciting, as we see Aang demonstrate his earthbending abilities quite a bit. And together with Toph and Katara, they make quick work of the soldiers and get to the palace. And once they reach the king, there's another interesting conversation to be had around how much a leader of a nation should be aware of its happenings. Obviously in this case, that is once again taken to 11, as the king isn't even aware of a war going on, but I think it does raise a good discussion topic. In a perfect world, a leader should be aware of everything going on, but that is obviously not possible. So, which sectors should he pay attention to? Is it education, scientific research, military, healthcare? But alright, that's beside the point and that's just a philosophical discussion. On the side of Zuko, we see him experiencing a severe fever after choosing to save Appa instead of going after Aang. And the whole sequence of Azula and Iroh being these two figures standing on his shoulders was just... Shift's keys. So, with all that being said, I think this is a middle-of-the-road C-tier episode. Definitely an exciting one, but once again just pushed down by default. Episode 219, The Guru. Alright, now we enter what I honestly think is pretty much the first part of the finale. Even though these episodes aren't directly linked, as we've seen with a few other two-parters in the show. The episode opens with the gang spreading up and going off on their own little missions. Sokka goes to meet his father, Aang goes to meet the Guru, Toph goes to meet her parents, and Katara goes to meet the Generals. This episode has an absolute boatload of character development and quite important details for the main gang. We see Sokka properly reconnect with his father and get a proper feel for what it is like to be among the warriors of the Water Tribe. For Toph, we of course see her embrace neutral Jing which Boomi had been talking about. She feels the refined pieces of earth within the cage she is trapped in, and develops the ability to bend metal itself. Toph's journey in this episode is particularly interesting to me, as she truly had to change the way she approaches challenges to get out of this one. We see her scream and shout at her captors, which obviously yields very little results. But once she slowed down and approached the issue in a more calculated manner, she achieved a new level in her bending abilities. Aang, of course, goes through the journey of opening his chakras, which would allow him to control the Avatar state. He is unable to let go of his feelings for Kataro, however, which arguably prompts him to return to Ba Sing Se, where she has been taken captive. And if we speak a little more broadly for a moment, I think this letting go of your emotional bounds is a lot of what the Avatar is actually about with this thought being echoed by Zaheer in The Legend of Korra. Technically speaking, for an Avatar to be a truly neutral force, he shouldn't have any affiliations whatsoever. But, as we see in Aang's case, without this bond, he might not have been able to save his friends and, by extension, the world. And finally, we have to talk about Zuko and Iroh very briefly in this episode as well, as we see an entirely different Zuko who is happily helping his uncle with the new tea shop. Though, as we'll find out very shortly, much of this is simply setting up yet another turn by Zuko in the very next episode, making the disappointments feel that much more impactful. And so, it shouldn't come as a surprise that I think this is an S-tier episode as well. Episode 220, The Crossroads of Destiny. 
And so, we have reached the finale of Book 2. One of the most important episodes in the entire series in my opinion. The episode begins with the gang reunited, but not knowing where Katara is, and being suspicious that something may have happened to her. Unexpectedly, Iroh appears, echoing the same sentiment about Zuko. And one aspect that I absolutely love here is how plainly Iroh comes directly to Aang for help. Broadly speaking, they are direct adversaries. But we already know that Iroh has absolutely no interest in ever catching the Avatar or harming any of them. So seeing him calmly talk to Aang as an equal was just really cool. And of course, this is where we get another brilliant speech from Iroh when him and Aang are trying to reach the Crystal Catacombs. As for Azula, we see that she has truly achieved the impossible, with the entirety of Ba Sing Se forces being under her control without ever firing a single shot. Through infiltrating the already corrupt Dai Li and taking charge of the force through sheer intimidation, for all intents and purposes, she along with Mei and Tai Li have taken over the impenetrable city of Ba Sing Se. If that doesn't speak to how cunning she is, then I don't know what will. All of this culminates in the true crossroads of destiny. I said the title. Where Zuko has to finally decide on whose side he really is. Only to let his uncle down and join Azula, who has already begun her attack on Team Avatar. A few notable bending scenes here. The first one is one of the very first strikes in the battle, Katara's double water strike was a really awesome one. Second, it's just Toph waiting for the Dai Li to leave, and then absolutely destroying what was supposed to be the impossible to bend metal door. It was just funny to see how easily she dealt with the problem. The third would have to be the air silhouettes that Aang sends running towards Zuko. It was a super unique attack that I don't think ever appears in the series before or again. Another one would have to be the attack from Zuko, who creates this sort of fire circle with a massive blast coming from the center. And of course, the very finale of the battle. Azula striking down Aang. I've already talked about this at nauseum, why I think this is one of the most important moments in the series, but in short, having Aang absolutely defeated at such a crucial point in the story is very very big. And I absolutely loved it. And lastly, we once again see Iroh's true colors, as he goes both against Zuko and Azula, protecting the injured Aang. This is very similar to what happens at the end of Book 1, with Iroh taking on Commander Zhao. Here too, he puts aside any of his affiliations and is simply trying to retain balance in the world by protecting the Avatar. And as soon as his goal is complete, he surrenders, and the fight is well and truly over. And thus, this will obviously fill the last spot on the Triple S tier as the highest ranking episode of the season. Looking at the higher tiers, you'll notice that many of the episodes are almost back to back, which I think is a major strong point of The Last Airbender. In a lot of series, you'll often have episodes that are very, very slow and are just setting up the next big action piece. But in Avatar, even the slower, more lore-heavy episodes have some absolutely awesome moments. I think the Guru is a very good example of this. While the prime focus is on Aang's mastery of the Avatar state, which of course is the largest factor in the finale, we still get to see Toph learn metal bending, and we see Katara being taken prisoner, etc. It is still a very exciting episode, despite obviously being set up for the finale. What you'll also probably notice is how much I enjoy the episodes heavy on world building, those being the swamp, the serpent's pass, and the desert. I think I talked about all of them at length too, so I won't rehash it here, as I think this video is already way too long as is. Lastly, I know many of you will say that you think Zuko alone absolutely deserves Triple S as well, and as I said before, I wholeheartedly agree. But for me personally, I enjoyed the finale and Tales of Ba Sing Se just a teeny bit more, which, due to the rules I have imposed for myself, push it down by default. But for all intents and purposes, I do think it is also a Triple S episode. 
But on the note of the tales of Ba Sing Se, I want to re-emphasize how important I think the fact that it is still among people's favorite episodes is. Because again, it is a very experimental format, with stories deeply focused on just a single or couple of characters. I think this just goes to show how masterfully every single one of the characters in the show is crafted, when an even seemingly non-important little slice of life-like story can shape the way I view the entire season. Again, we spend like 4 minutes following Momo around, with no real words ever being spoken, but I still remember every single moment of that tale. If that is not deserving of a chef's kiss, then I don't know what will. And the very final thing, what I still find absolutely crazy, is that I can still find new details in the episodes, even though I've been re-watching the series fairly regularly for the past like, what, 14-15 years now? If you have not noticed, I absolutely love this series. Phew, well, we've come to an end of what is probably once again one of my longest videos ever. So why don't we do the thing again? If you've made it this far, well, firstly, thank you for listening to my annoying voice for like, what, 50 minutes? And secondly, leave a comment, whatever it may be, and include the words lemon tea. I love reading the creative things you guys come up with, and we'll see how many of you have made it here. But like, you have no idea how hard it was making this tier list. I think I spent way too much mental effort trying to rank a 15 year old cartoon. But hey, it was fun right? If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you did all the YouTube things to help with the blessing of the algorithm. And if you wish to support the channel even further, consider joining the Patreon where for as little as $1 per month, you can get access to all of the benefits. Speaking of which, massive shout out to our current patrons who allow me to produce more of these insanely long videos for you all. Seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye